we're just 18 months away from a general election and the choice that the British people could make will shape the kind of country that we live in for generations. If we've learned anything from the crash, then it's this. Politics is too important to be left to politicians. Now, people don't just need us to tell them how tough life is for them. They want to hear the alternative. They want hope and they want action. It was five years ago this month, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy in New York, citing debt of over $600 billion. A price tag on obscene greed and monumental stupidity that sent shockwaves around the world. But we all know that the roots of that crash go much deeper. They go back more than three decades to the election of Margaret Thatcher's government. When the right set out to break the post-war consensus, because once it seemed that everybody agreed that the state should provide decent public services and social security as a human shield against boom-bust capitalism. Everyone saw the value of a mixed economy that put the brakes on uh, private monopolies and guaranteed a public realm, but no longer. What followed the election of that government became the articles of a new economic faith. A fire sale of public assets, deregulation of the city, weaker worker rights. And trade unions, once respected across the political spectrum for our role in fighting fascism and as a pillar of any free and democratic society, now treated with disdain. The values of a mythical Middle England came to dominate, stretching the United Kingdom to breaking point. The city and the new kids on the block, private equity, hedge funds, share traders, increasingly called the shots. And they unleashed an escalation of greed and inequality that ultimately led to the financial crash, creating a new Anglo-American model that was a kind of capitalism on crack cocaine. But it wasn't always this way. Whatever happened to the Conservative Party that over 100 years ago backed Winston Churchill's proposal for tripartite wages councils so that every worker would be guaranteed a living wage? Whatever happened to the Conservative Party of John Major, who at least felt obliged to promise voters a classless society? Remember that one? And whatever happened to the Conservative Party of Theresa May, who once warned against becoming a nasty party, but who just this summer sent government-funded bans onto the streets of multiracial London, brandishing a slogan last used by the National Front, shame on them. This government seems intent on dividing Britain Thatcher-style between those in work and those out of it, between the top ta taxpayers and everyone else, between the metropolitan elite with their country retreats in Chipping Norton and the so-called desolate North. Governments may have had no choice about bailing out the banks, but they have got a political choice about what went wrong and where we go next. After all, the rest of continental Europe did not deliberately deindustrialize and make a fetish of financial services in the way that Britain did. And today, while of course, many workers in many countries have also seen their living stands, standards fall, they have not taken the same hit we have and trade unionism is not vilified in the same way. Even from the European engine room of austerity in Berlin, the German Chancellor still defends co-determination. And her finance minister 
has called on business to meet union demands for better pay as a way to boost consumer demand. Now, here in the UK, more thoughtful Conservatives are a little bit nervous that this war on working people will lose votes. They admit that the Conservatives are seen as the party of the rich and privileged. They worry that attacks on the unions of ordinary decent working men and women look high-handed, cold-hearted and out of touch. To paraphrase Rex Harrison in My Fair Lady, they say, why can't David Cameron be more like Angela Merkel? But instead of listening to his moderates, the Prime Minister is in hock to those who demand an ever more uncompromising stand. Plenty of ugly talk about a crackdown on migrants, but no crackdown on those bosses who use cheap labour to cut costs. Tough on welfare fraud, for sure, but no sympathy for those unlucky enough to fall on hard times or lose a job. Freedom to raise prices for big business, but no pay rise for ordinary families. Decent families up and down the land facing worries that the Eaton educated elite, with their serial holidays, hired help and inherited millions, simply haven't got a clue about. And beyond the rhetoric, what has this government actually done to recover and rebalance Britain's economy? Invest for the future in greening Britain's infrastructure? No. Leave the banks alone and slash state capital investment by £22 billion. Back Britain's advanced manufacturing base? No. Hand out government contracts to the cheapest bidder, regardless of the cost to local business and jobs. Build affordable housing? No. Launch a lending scheme that risks the very same perfect storm that got us into this mess in the first place and then slap on a cruel bedroom tax for good measure. The government is rehearsing the same old arguments, repeating the same old mistakes, rehashing the same old bust economic model built on sand. Now I know that Conservatives are fond of referring to their PR man, Linton Crosby, as their very own Wizard of Oz. But what does that make Cameron, Osborne and Clegg? When it comes to any vision for a new economy, they are the scarecrow, the tin man and the cowardly lion. No brain, no heart and no courage. Now, in many ways, it is a testimony to the enduring strength of our trade union values of care, compassion and fairness that the right has chosen to put us in the firing line. It explains why this week they are debating a lobbying bill that, far from dealing with the real dirt in politics, is designed to deny us a political voice. Now, debating the internal arrangements of the Labour Party and the role of its affiliated unions is not the business of Westminster or indeed this Congress. And in the hall today, we also have unions who are just as proud of their party political independence. But one thing is sure, we are united in defending the basic democratic principle that ordinary people have the right to a political voice. <laughs> that union money, the few pence freely given each week by nurses, shop workers and train drivers, is the cleanest cash in politics today. And that whether unions set up a political fund is a matter for members, not ministers. Because for too long, 
politics has been controlled by those who already have far too much money and far too much power. Half of the Conservative Party's funding comes from the city. One third of their new intake of MPs are drawn from the banking industry alone. And we know what happens when the super rich get to run the tax system. In contrast, unions are Britain's biggest democratic membership movement of ordinary people. Now we are already required by the law to report our membership records every year. We have more than 10 times the membership of all Britain's political parties put together. It may even be more. The truth is, we simply don't know, because political parties don't have to account for their members in the way that we have to account for ours. In fact, the Conservative Party refuses point blank to say how many members it has. But I'm pretty sure that David Cameron has fewer members than our very own Sally Hunt or Steve Murphy or Mike Clancy and maybe even Bob Crow. So before he starts lecturing unions about transparency, the Prime Minister should take a long, hard look in the mirror. We already publish our numbers. I challenge David Cameron to publish his. But more than this, and here is the democratic bottom line, if unions were denied a political voice, we wouldn't have had the 1944 Education Act, we wouldn't have the NHS, we wouldn't have equal pay for women, and we wouldn't have a minimum wage. And remember who first exposed the scandal of tax avoidance? Who first raised the alarm on falling living standards? And who first blew the whistle on zero hours? you can see why some people want to shut us up. That's why we have to stand up for our rights, not just union rights, civil rights, people's rights. The government has attacked the union link to Labour, a link that, of course, will evolve and change over time. But their real aim is to discredit all unions. And the reason is simple. We stand for popular policies to shift wealth and power from the few to the many. So if they can't win the policy argument, then attack them as trade union demands. If they don't like what we say, then call us union paymasters. And if all else fails, then try that old trick of smears. The government may be preparing for a humiliating climb down on some of the worst parts of the lobbying bill, but don't be fooled into thinking that the battle for civil liberties has been won. Unions will still be hit by cuts in funding limits. Many charities could find themselves clobbered too. And shockingly, one thing is sure, this bill will virtually close down hope not hate and unite against fascism in what amounts to a free gift to the BNP. They should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> Congress, this is an anti-democratic, dangerous bill, and it must be defeated. But Congress, I also need to issue a challenge to the cynics within our own ranks too. Now, we've all heard people say that the next election doesn't matter. You don't have to go very far to hear people say that there's no difference between the parties. It doesn't matter who wins. They're all in it for themselves. Now, I respect everybody's right to an opinion, but I must tell you, they are wrong. The result of the next election does matter. It matters a lot. To the unemployed teenager desperate for a decent job, to the young family hoping for a decent home, and to the elderly, the disabled, and their carers who know that there must be a better way. 
For trade unionists to argue that voting is a waste of time is a dangerous game that plays into the hands of our opponents. Now, yesterday, we debated industrial action. And we all know that we always try to find a fair resolution to our disputes. But let me be crystal clear. The TUC is always ready to coordinate industrial action whenever unions want it and whenever members vote for it. But let's remember this. Ever since the Chartists first lifted their banners, the democratic voice of the people has always been our best weapon against rule by the markets, the rich and the powerful. To deny that would be a betrayal of the millions of our members whose jobs, living standards and pay depend on it. Now, I'm certainly not arguing that we should button up and keep quiet in the run-up to the election, as uh, the government's lobbying bill wants to see. Nor am I arguing that we should put up with some kind of vanilla version of austerity. On the contrary. But it does mean that we have to roll up our sleeves and start helping to shape the choices on offer at that next election. We need to win public opinion to our policies and we need to prove that they're election winners. Remember when we first campaigned for a minimum wage? The business lobby said it would wreck the economy and politicians trembled. Now it's as much a part of mainstream British culture as curry and chips. It's time for us to push for the same kind of ambitious policies to transform the economy, improve working lives and change the country for the better. A popular programme that can inspire voter confidence, a test of both values and valour. This is what we want to see on a pledge card to take to the doorstep. And today I want to challenge politicians from all parties to tell us where they stand on it. First, decent jobs. It's time to restore that goal of full employment and give a cast iron guarantee of jobs to the young. Full employment is the best way to boost the economy, drive up living standards and generate the tax that we need to pay down the deficit. And let's be clear, the reason why low paid jobs are growing is because people have no choice but to take them. And that is wrong. Employers should compete for staff, not the other way around. Now, I know that George Osborne will say, but how are you going to pay for it? Well, of course, the best way to pay for it is by getting economic growth. That's why we need to invest in an intelligent industrial strategy for the future. But if the Chancellor wants to talk numbers, then here's a big one. According to the rich list, since the crash, the 1,000, just 1,000 richest people in Britain increased their wealth by no less than 190 billion pounds. That's nearly double, just so you get it in perspective, that is nearly double the entire budget for the NHS. So when they ask, how we'll pay for it, let's tell them, fair taxes, that's how. <laughs> now, as we've heard, one of the best ways to create jobs and apprenticeships would be to build new houses. And that's pledge number two, one million new council and affordable homes. Our country has a desperate shortage of housing. That means landlords rake it in and the housing benefit bill rockets. It drives up the cost of buying a home and it puts people in more debt. So cut the waiting list, stop the bubble, and let's build the homes that young families desperately need. Pledge number three, fair 
pay and new wages councils to help back it up. Of course, the national minimum wage should go up and we need tough enforcement. But take one look at company profits and you'll see that there are plenty of industries that could and should pay more. That's why we need new wages councils so that unions and employers get around the table and negotiate. That's the best way to guarantee not just a minimum wage, not just a living wage, but a fair wage and fair shares of the wealth that workers help to create. And pledge number four could be the most popular one of all. Let's pledge that the NHS will once again be a public service run for people, not for profit. Let's make adult social care a community responsibility by bringing it together with the NHS. In fact, that would save money because good social care helps elderly people stay at home when they want to be instead of in hospital when they don't. And while we're about it, delegates, if you'll let me add this, let's have a proper system of childcare too. So, <laughs> so instead of shrinking our welfare state, let's strengthen it. That is the way to build a stronger economy too. And five, the last one fair rights at work. No more union busting, no more blacklisting, and no more zero hours. <laughs> Instead, we need decent employment rights, strong and free trade unions. And let's have some more economic democracy too. We already work with the best employers, keeping workers healthy and safe, giving them the chance to learn new skills, guaranteeing fair pay and treatment. Through the worst of the recession, we made thousands of sensible agreements to save jobs and keep plants open. And let me say this, I believe that there isn't a boardroom in Britain that wouldn't benefit from giving ordinary workers a say. Of course, these aren't the only issues on which we campaign. We also oppose the creeping privatisation of our education system. We want our railways returned to public ownership. And Congress, let's send a strong message from this hall that we will fight this latest senseless, stupid sell-off of the family silver, hands off Royal Mail. got sensible policies, good policies, popular policies, and their importance is that together they make a promise for a better future. They cut through the pessimism, they give people confidence. So I want to end not just by asking Congress to back the General Counsel's statement that I moved today, but more importantly, to unite, to organise and to campaign. I want to quote uh, the late, great Seamus Heaney, the great Irish poet who died recently, he told us to move lips, move minds, and let new meanings flare. For the people that we saw on that film, for a new economy that puts the interests of working people at its heart, for our values of equality, solidarity, and democracy, so that together, we build a Britain of which we can all be proud. Thank you very much, Congress.